Hi, Nick Knight. Hi, Carrie. <laughs> How are you? Good, thank you very much. So we thought that in advance of um, your opening at the Mass in yeah. Tokyo, yeah. that we should talk a little bit about maybe your lesser known body of work, right. which would be your still lifes. Right, okay. And only lesser known against the fashion that you're so yes. well known for. <laughs> yes. Um, but you are, in all seriousness, you're debuting three new bodies of work there well, yeah. to Japan. Yeah. Um, and it starts, begins with Flora, yeah. and then goes to Roses in Your Garden and um, the photo painting yeah. work. Mm -hmm. Why? Why have you turned your eye towards nature? Uh, I think it's a sort of something that you do because nature isn't man-made. Nature's got a sort of, uh, not a purity to it, but a sort of untouchedness to it, which one's always slightly in awe of. It feels, and I, at times, that you need to do that. It's not a palate cleansing, but it's a something that feels refreshing, that you're dealing with something which hasn't been constructed by another artist, that isn't somebody's design, that wasn't made to make money. Um, so things which have evolved naturally. I think there's something quite interesting in that, partly because they are so incredibly complex and so incredibly joyful and so incredibly um, whimsical sometimes and other times deeply beautiful and poetic and tragic and all those sorts of things. So they have lots of different values within them um, and they say lots of different things. So there's a sort of refreshing way to look at, look at things. Is there, though, a completely different approach for you in looking at something that is inherently still mm. versus looking at a body that moves? Yes, I mean, there's, there's different versions of stillness here. Um, these this series here, which are the pressed flowers from London's Natural History Museum, they are pressed herbarium specimens, so they are very still. And I like the stillness because it's about a permanence. What we see in the other collections of pictures I'm showing is a sort of poetic transience. So if you want in the rose pictures, they're beautiful because they're about to die. And what I liked about the herbarium specimens is they have a permanence to them. So they're very still in a permanent way, which gives them a sort of strength, which isn't normally associated with flower imagery. Can you tell that story? I obviously know where these came from, but yeah. maybe some people watching don't. Sure. So, so these ones here, which are from my book Flora, they originated from the Natural History Museum's herbarium specimens. I did a job for the Natural History Museum, which took me a year, um, and it was an exhibition called Plant Power, which was on for it was a permanent exhibition at the Natural History Museum. But I didn't get paid to do that, I did it out of the love of doing something. And to thank me, the Natural History Museum said, could they offer me some access to something in their collection? And I said, yes, I would love to see, the herb I'd love to be able to work with the herbarium. Herbarium is incredibly long, contains six and a half million specimens. Crazy. And it took me and my wife Charlotte three and a half years to go from one end of the herbarium, looking at every specimen to get to the other end. You go through fungi and seaweeds and grasses. And for days, right? Like For days. Well, it's three and a half years. I mean, it wasn't every day for three and a half years, but over the course of three and a half years, we put in as much possible time we could in there. Um, and it's, it was something that was very, in a way, very nice because at that time, there were no mobile phones because it was in the middle of the 90s. And so you'd go into the herbarium and you wouldn't be disturbed all day long. So it was quite quiet and still. Um, and you just go through these specimens and a lot of the time you see exactly what you think you're going to see, which is a kind of dry brown leaf or twig. And then all of a sudden you'll find something amazing, which you've never really seen before. So a cactus flower or um, some seaweed or something that just has some absolute beauty to it. You just wouldn't expect. I'm not a religious man. I don't believe in God. So for me, it was quite um, what I found joyful and unexpected was the fact it felt like there was a sort of, if you looked at the amount of, creativeness, of whimsy, of folly, of eccentricity within the shapes and the forms and the colours. They felt like ch children's drawings or architectural plans or machinery or old paintings. So there's an enormous amount of kind of uh, diversity and, and difference within them. And it did feel like there's probably somebody who was having fun creating these. But of course the person that's having fun is evolution. Um, when you then look at these as, comp as compared to your still lifes. Yes. There's a real different language, right? Because yes. these, as you say, have been pressed by someone. Yes. Um, whereas you have constructed a composition. Yes. And whenever I look at them, it does sort of occur to me that there's an inherently different like texture to these. Mm. But that's down to the process, right? So the way yes. that you've... Yes, well, for a start, these are, these are flower specimens that have been laid out by scientists for scientific research. So they're done with, with that in mind, that's why they're here. 
Um, the way we did it is we took them on a piece of paper that was that they originally uh, laid out on. We put it on a light box and put a light above it. So the structure of the flower comes from the light coming through the paper and the colour of the flower comes from the light landing on the paper. So that gives you your sort of your intense colours but your structure of them. So they're lit quite specially to bring out both colour and structure. But are for all intents and purposes scientific uh, in their purpose. Whereas the, 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 the roses are, if you want, poetic in their purpose. How do you mean? They're expressing emotion, not expressing knowledge or intellect. Or, or not, they're expressing emotion rather than the sort of, you know, here I am so you can study my structure. The, with the Rose series, what I'm trying to do is get across some form of emotion or desire or some sort of feeling of a, a melancholy or a, a deep love or those sorts of things, which, which should be, but really aren't considered scientific thoughts. So I think it, it is kind of impossible to talk about either of these without addressing one, the still life as a genre, yeah. right? which is all about um, dead nature, which is what mm. the, the French termed it um, in the 17th, 18th century. Nature mort. There you go, thank you, says the man who can speak French. Um, but then there's also, uh, in thinking about talking to you, I started thinking about Susan Sontag and that she says, you know, famously, that every time anyone takes a picture, they're participating in the death of that object or that person. Yeah. Um, and that, that I don't know if you could say that's true of Flora, no. but I think you could say it's true of the Roses from My Garden series. Yes, I might take a slight um, difference to what Susan Sontag said, to be honest. So I don't see that every time I take a picture of somebody I'm participating in their death. Surely the idea of a photograph is it prolongs life. That's why we all avidly collect pictures of our children and our families, because it prolongs those moments of pleasure. So in fact, life becomes longer. And if we ever lost a relative or somebody we care about, often we'll refer back to a picture to prolong that memory. So I would probably take some sort of um, disagreement with Susan Sontag's concept or premise. Uh, but yes, in, in, indeed, these, these specimens can be 300 years old. Um, and they, they, are, they are things that were collected on some of the earliest voyages on the Mayflower and, and different um, explorations set out from Britain to gather the sort of botany of the world and to bring it back um, and show it and study it. So I'm going to just continue to use yes. Susan Sontag because she does actually say, and this resonated against, and we have to slightly switch, and then I guess we'll come back to these, but um, she verbatim says, precisely by slicing out this moment and freezing it, all photographs testify to time's relentless melt. Mm. And when I read that, of course, I thought of the, of the drip photo paintings. Yeah. Because those, as compositions, you've taken a, a regular photograph mm. and turned it into a painting that you then literally mm. melt. Yes. Um, so that kind of resonated with that series for me. But I wondered, when you first saw those, what, what was it that drew you to them? Was it that idea that the fragility of the image was dripping off the page, or was it just a purely aesthetic, m more aesthetic than conceptual? I think it's, we're driven primarily by aesthetics, to be honest. You're, 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 you, you see something and it excites you, so you're attracted towards it. So I think primarily you're driven by aesthetics, so I like the effect of it. And then I could then post-rationalise it and say, okay, well, actually, this reminds me and this makes sense and this fits into what I'm trying to say. And you can then sort of make some logic behind it and try and explain almost to yourself why you like it. But the initial reaction is purely, purely emotional. It's purely an aesthetic sort of enjoyment of something. Um, with the, the photo paintings, as you say, we print out on a piece of paper which doesn't accept the ink. So I take a photograph, a classical, very classical photograph of roses, and then I print it on a piece of paper, a large piece of paper, sort of six foot by four foot, which doesn't accept the ink, so the ink is then running in pools on it. And I take it and I tip the paper one way or another to increase the, that paint so it runs faster or runs in a certain direction. And then I'll take it into a room which is full of steam, which further increases it, and I'll work with steam on the image. So you can actually steam off bits so you can increase the amount of sort of um, the amount of dripping and the amount of, of, of the, the paint coming off it. And then you have to take it out, stop at the right point, and then fix it before it completely goes. And not leave it up overnight to dry. No, so as you end up with one floor. Um, so it is a very physical process. And there is something, perhaps in me, perhaps in other photographers, that feels a little bit, um, what's the best way of putting this, but excited by the idea of paint. Mm. So excited by the idea of painting. Because photography is a very... Uh, can be a very mechanical way of approaching life. So, and I think painting is so freed up of that, that there's a slight envy to have that freedom. 
So when you're trying to take a photograph of somebody, to sculpt them with your lighting and your camera and your lens and your angle and everything else into what you want them to look like, of course a painter can do that just by gesture of a hand. So I think there's probably a sort of uh, a desire to experiment with that freedom um, which comes with painting. So the fact that I could take a picture or a photograph of a rose and tip it and it becomes a whole wave of flowing colours and starts to become something else just by the sheer gravity and, and my physical manipulation of it is exciting, exhilarating. What then yeah. brought you to the newest series, which no one has seen yet, which yeah. is Roses from My Garden, but on glass plates? Yeah. Well, that's quite an interesting uh, joining of, of, of two very, very important periods. The beginning of photography, when they would coat a glass paint with a photo emul photosensitive emulsion, mm -hmm. and what you see on your iPhone now, or on your mobile phone, on your Samsung, or whatever else you're using, it's the idea of an image behind glass. And I think both of those things, are, that's, that's where we are with image making at the moment, is we look at things on a glass screen, which coincidentally goes back to the first things I used to do. And I like the objectness of that, so seeing actually you know, something that looks very delicate, you know, presented as an object, which isn't really a photograph, because it doesn't have the language of photographic prints, has more the language of a sort of, I don't know, a, a, a sort of daguerreotype or something like that. So it's not con contemporary photography in a way, if it's anything, it's right at the beginning, but it looks, for some reason, more like the sort of thing that we all have in our pockets on our phones. So I like that sort of, um, that junction, that link between those two things, between the beginning of photography and where we are now with image making. I also think that the scale jump is super exciting, almost as you say, because you can see images on a screen that's like this. Yeah. It's really nice to see fine art like this. It's yeah. a, it, that language is now so present in our lives that it feels natural to have yeah. it again. It's not the most well-formed idea, but... Um, <laughs> so this is kind of a... This is a very geeky question. Okay. Um, but in the sort of early, well, early Christians and by the Middle Ages, um, the rose had really become a symbol and it had a secret language yeah. in paintings. Um, and it could stand in for the Virgin Mary, the goddess Venus, and by extension, love. Mm -hmm. um, what does the rose mean to you? Um, well, I mean, weirdly, I mean, I've been trying to work out, again, is sort of you know, looking back and trying to make some sense of it. Uh, my mother's middle name was Rose. Oh. The only tattoo I have on my body is of a rose. Um, so there's a the more, more haphazard coincidence than anything else. Um, but I started photographing roses for the Natural History Museum. It was the first time I was asked to photograph them. And I like the fact that their petals look like brush strokes, that sometimes they look like couture dresses, other times they look like feathers. So they, they sort of pulled on things that I liked in any case. And I liked, as I said earlier, the, the poetic tragedy of the rose. You know, the fact that it says, you know, it, it's saying, here I am, aren't I beautiful, and I'm about to die. Um, and I think that sort of almost Victorian poetic tragedy is, is rather appealing. So I, I like melancholy as a sort of, uh, uh, as a state. Um, I think perhaps we're wrong in seeking happiness in life. I think that's probably a, a false goal and not necessarily what we should all look towards. So I look, I look at things that are melancholic uh, and with interest. And I think some of that is in the rose. The rose has a, a beauty to it, which is there in a very transient form. And of course, the, 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 you know, the fragrance you get from a rose is very important. We're not seeing that, we're not smelling that mm. with the photographs. This is part of my process. The, the, the way I work with the roses is actually very simple. They're grown in my garden, as the title would suggest, and I photograph them usually at weekends um, on my kitchen table with my phone. Um, and they don't go through anything. It's literally my phone and the rose and me, and that's it, and there's nobody else involved. However, it will take me about five hours to get the picture I like. So I'll probably start about half past nine and then end up in sort of around 1.30 or a little bit later sometimes, um, just to try and get the picture I want. And what's quite, I've noticed, is a little fraction of a millimetre of a pixel change in the angle or the orientation can make all the difference. So it's, if you imagine somebody fine-tuning a piano, mm. I'm doing the visual equivalent of that. And it's not right until it's in tune. And I can spend hours just tweaking. If you ever look through all the pictures I've taken, there's probably about three or four hundred of each rose, you can see this progression that gets to a certain point and hardly changes, but to me it makes a lot of difference. Mm. And you know, the difference between the one that I choose and the one before that that I didn't choose is vast. It's not in tune, it's not harmonious, it's not melodic. So that's a lot of it, a lot of the care goes into actually just that super subtle tuning of the image. Do you think you'd ever go back to working on large format? And doing yeah. still lifes? Yeah, absolutely. I don't, I, I, the, the 
techniques one uses are important and not important. They're not important because they're just a means to an end. Mm. They're important because they do, to some degree, shape the work, to some degree. So if you're working with a large format camera, you're working at one sheet, of, one sheet of film at a time, you're putting a lot more time into the image before you actually press the shutter. If you're working with your iPhone, then you're, shut, you're clicking away pretty constantly throughout. And they do give a slightly different pace of language, but it's no different to how we speak. Sometimes we whisper, we talk very quietly. And other times we want to shout, you know, be loud and commanding and all those sorts of things. So I think it's, it's, it's like how we speak. Mm. What we're saying is important and how we say it is appropriate to what we're saying but it's not the most important thing. And you look at, you know, the message is what's important. How you deliver that message is just appropriate at the time and place you're delivering it. Mm. The, on message, um, I was thinking a bit about Maplethorpe's flowers right. and how they became um, sort of symbols for the AIDS movement and they were erotically charged yeah. as well, yeah. but they were, they were real, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm gonna look at my notes. Uh, there were tributes to his friends as well. Right. And you over the years, from a queen, for instance, yeah. um, you've done the same. Mm. Is, do you think doing a still life like that, that is in tribute to someone, is, um, it's just a natural part of that macabre that we just talked about, or is there... No, I think it's just a human gesture. I think it's just a friendship thing or a love thing. I think you, you do them. Um, or you give them, or you, you, you do them in, in memory of, or, but it's just a sort of, yeah, a nice, pleasant thing to do. I don't think that shapes the work. The work is, 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 has its own reasons mm -hmm. to be, but then if you, want to, if you create a piece of work that you're happy with, or that you feel is something is important or, or powerful or should be, you know, should be considered, then I think that's a nice thing to give to somebody. It's just, but it's just a present. It isn't, they aren't usually created with a, that sort of thought in mind. Occasionally I have done, occasionally I've done pieces of work, or sorry, pictures of flowers, thinking about somebody particular mm. and my emotional connection with that person, but often not. I'm just looking at the flower and working with it. Last question. Yes. Um, are there any still lifes by other photographers that you really like? Yeah, lots actually. I mean, I, there are so many photographers who've done such great work. Um, you look at the work of Joseph Sudek, for instance, I think a Hungarian photographer, I could be wrong, but I think Hungarian, who lost his arm in one of the wars, and he photographed, you know, just a, a glass of water. Um, and just, and he, most of his photographs were taken just from one room looking outside or using the light that came in through the window. Um, his work's beautiful, but I mean, there were so many characters, to be honest. Um, it, it's hard to narrow it down to a few. Obviously, Irving Penn's roses are, are such a thing. Um, and Maplethorpe, as you quite rightly talk about. You know, Blumenfeld worked a lot with flowers. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of photographers engage with it. In, in a way, it became a, or has become a little bit in the way that architects tend to make a chair. Um, photographers tend to photograph flowers. Uh, it's, it's a, it's, I think it's a, a sort of a strange quirk of the, of the job. But it's, there are there's so many different photographers doing such great things all the time. I'm permanently sort of excited by the photography I see. Good. We're excited by these. Good. Good luck <laughs> next month.